Uh, but today, guess what we're talking about? Probably one of the most, uh, it's a topic that not a lot of people want to talk about. It's, not, it's a topic that a lot of people, when I say it, you might just be like, <gasps> you might tense up a little bit. And today, like I said, we're, or like this video said, we're in the series Answers, and we're doing our best job, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. Jake killed it last week, talking about why Christianity is the only way. And we're answering all the tough questions that everybody asks, Christians and non-Christians, when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to God, when it comes to all these different things, right? And this specific Sunday, we're going to talk about why this question that we might hear is, why would a loving God send people to hell? That's the big one. That's the one that maybe, I don't know if anybody's confident enough, but does anybody have like, you know, I have a good reason, I have a good example of that, or I have a good explanation, anybody? It's a there it is, and we're going to start there. He doesn't. That's simple enough, right? That's, but that's kind of the route that we're going to go, and that's exactly what we're going to say. Thank you, Mama, Mama T. <laughs> but that, that assumption, right, is why would a loving God send people to hell? And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about it. But first, we're going to start with our key verse for the series, and it's in 1 Peter 3.15, and it says this. Oh, always, I haven't said this in a while. When we come to church, we should always come ready to study, ready to dive in, ready to take notes, ready to do all those things. Because imagine going to the gym and just watching everybody else work out and expecting something to happen to you. <laughs> That's exactly what going to church, just to sit there, plop down for like an hour and then leave. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. There's going to be no spiritual growth, nothing of that sort. So when you come to church, this is like the safest place you can be into it, okay? Like you can't be into it here. It's going to be tough outside. But anyways... We're going to start by reading this, and it says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. That's first and foremost. Well, it doesn't matter if we have answers if we're not honoring Christ the Lord as holy. It says, Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. The point being here is, unfortunately, Christians have kind of led led this charge that we just need to be blind faith sort of people, but actually in context, blind faith and how people talk about it today doesn't even make sense, but that's for another time. But we're supposed to just be these blind faith, there's nothing that we could put uh, truth in, and we just kind of believe in fairy tales, right? That's kind of the consensus to the outside world. And so we're doing this because I want you guys to be knowledgeable. I want, our church wants you guys to be knowledgeable. Our church wants you to be confident when you uh, evangelize. Because the truth be told, nobody wants to evangelize if we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Uh, e even within simple things like movies or shows, if somebody's talking about a show I've never seen, I have nothing to say. Nor do I care to say anything, because I, I, don't, I don't know anything about it. It's the same thing with Christianity. It's the same thing with Christ when it comes to the Bible. But always, 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 right? We start first by honoring Christ the Lord as holy, and everything we do, do it with gentleness and respect. That's our starting point. That's where we start. So let's hop into this. We've got to understand, I talked about this a few weeks ago, too, is that humans are kind of hardwired for justice, okay? As human beings, we, we are hardwired for justice. It's why you see people protest through streets. It's why you see uh, people throw paint, red paint, on people who are wearing fur coats, right? We're so hardwired for it. We want to, when somebody does something bad or evil or we see as bad or evil, we want them to pay, and I think the consensus, if you ask anybody, if somebody murders, if somebody steals, if somebody rapes, if anybody does something like that, they need to pay. They need to pay a price. They need to be punished. And we see that, and we understand that that's hardwired within human beings because Christ, because God put it in us. And so this justice that we cry for as humans, this justice, this, uh, this offense that we want to be paid for when people wrong us or wrong other people, this justice is exactly what the idea of hell is about. It's exactly what hell is, is justice. And we're going to talk about that and go into it because something that we need to understand is... Westerners, us on this continent, have a very rough time with the idea of hell, with the idea of eternal punishment, with the idea of eternal punishment. But here's what we got to see, and here's what we got to look, and here's the perspective change that we kind of have to see, is that there are villages in Africa and many other parts of the world, but we'll stick to Africa, where people come in, steal all the daughters of the village by the hundreds, and take them and sell them into sex slavery, and or make them become suicide bombers. It's the same in the Middle East, Baghdad, Iraq, all those places. And this happens consistently. 
And so we got to imagine this. Do we think, because like I said, Westerners have a big problem with this idea of eternal justice, but do we think that people around the world all over have that same idea when it comes to eternal justice? Do we think that those parents, those parents of the daughters who are all stolen, who are all taken, who are forced into sex slavery, who are forced to become suicide bombers, do we think that they have any problem with the idea of those people being punished for eternity? Do we think they have a problem with that? I don't think they lose any sleep over that idea. I don't think they have any issue with that idea. And in matter of fact, to people like that who experience deep injustice, a God who doesn't bring eternal justice is not a God that is worth worshiping. And here we are in our Western culture thinking of justice and it's like, that's wrong, we should be able to do whatever we want and not be punished. Around the world, it's not like that. And so what we have to reconcile, and I'm sure a lot of us in here already understand that and already get that, but what we have to reconcile in our hearts and what our friends have to understand, what our um, coworkers, because like I said, this whole series is so you guys talk about these things. This whole series is so you guys reach out. I hope there's people in your head right now. But what we got to get people to see and Westerners to see is that we don't have the corner of truth, unfortunately. I wish it were so. We don't have the corner of truth when it comes to the idea of eternal justice. As a matter of fact, I'd say we'd, we're kind of far behind. Because the truth of God extends past Western culture, past Eastern culture, past everything, and it's just truth. And just because our culture believes something or believes that eternal justice is wrong does not mean that that's true. Okay, we have to focus in on what God says, on what he says. And I would, I would posit that none of us would think that our thoughts are superior than everybody else's in the world, right? Because the people who have the most problem with hell would say that we're far advanced, right? Would say that we know way more, but they'd be afraid to say it. Because <laughs> nobody wants to say that. Nobody wants to think that they're superior, especially in today's culture. There's no way. There's no way. And so when we talk about truth and when we talk about eternal justice and when we talk about these things, here's what we got to see. It's one of my first points is that when we discern truth and what's true and what's not, we have to uh, understand that not liking something, not liking something, right, is not a sufficient way of discerning what is true or what is false. Just because I don't like something doesn't mean it's true or, excuse me, false. Just because I don't like it doesn't mean, just because it offends me, just because I'm not about it doesn't mean it's not true. And that's a terrible, if that's the, uh, like, kind of the epistemological framework that we move forward in, in discerning truth, it's not going to get us anywhere. It's not going to get us anywhere. As a matter of fact, we're going to decide what truth is each and every day. If that's our method to finding truth, there's eventually no truth at the end of that road. Okay? And the thing about hell, because here's what a lot of Christians do. There's this idea that whether it's progressive Christianity or... Um, red letter Christianity, which is the idea, it's like, I only go off Jesus' words, you know? I only, only red letter, I don't read the Old Testament, I don't read any of the prophets, the Torah, none of that, I don't read any of it. Just what Jesus says. Because Jesus is all about peace and love and unity, right? It's not like the Bible says that he came with a sword, like they forget all about that. And, but the thing is about Jesus, we can't tiptoe around it in this progressive way or in this way that says, I'm just a red letter Christian. It's all about peace and love, baby, you know? We can't be that because the thing about hell and eternal justice and punishment is that 13% of all Jesus' teachings, 13%, somebody did the math, not me, I promise. I'm not that good at math. <laughs> uh, but 13% of Jesus' teachings are about eternal punishment or about hell or about eternal justice. So it's something that we can't tiptoe around. It's something that we, we can't just make it be whatever we want, because if Jesus talked about it, the Old Testament talked about it, then we have to understand what it is, and we, ha we have to walk through it. We can't walk around it, because the thing is, God's truth offends everybody at some point. It should. It should, because I'm not God, and uh, none of y'all are God, <laughs> So none of y'all have it right, and I don't have it right 100% of the time, but God does. And right, just because I like something or don't like something doesn't mean it's not God's truth. So let's start with that assumption, and Kristen said it best, because here's, here's the assumption, is, and the question is, why would a loving God send people to hell? That's the big question. And I think Timothy Keller says it the best. Oh, let me stop, actually, for one second. I forgot I was supposed to say this up top. 
This one's going to be a little bit more dense, okay? <laughs> I promise. This talk's going to be a little bit more dense, but just follow along with me. Joe Rogan and um, Jordan Peterson did, just did like a four-hour podcast. And if we could listen to that, if we could listen to stuff like that, I promise we could get through this, okay? So let's just get through it together. But Timothy Keller said it best when, when people make that assumption of why would a loving God send people to hell? I'm just going to read his words. It's not on the screen. It's just right here. This is what Timothy Keller writes. He writes, people often paint this picture when thinking about hell, that God gives people time, and if we have not made the right decisions by the end of our lives, he casts the soul into hell for eternity. As the poor soul falls through space, they cry, mercy, Lord, mercy, to which God replies, it's too late for you. Now you will suffer. And this is the idea that people have. I think that's the fair assumption that people have. It's not a true assumption, but this is the assumption people have about when it comes to hell. That people are crying for mercy, Lord, mercy, 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 and he's just like, no, I don't care about you. I don't care about you. But that's, that's false because, like Kristen said, people do not go to hell or face eternal justice against their will. That's the thing. People do not go against their will, but hell is mankind's choice to be given their freedom from God forever. It's mankind's choice to be given freedom from God forever. They live that way here. What makes us think that they live their whole, if we live our whole life apart from God, wanting to be separate from God, that we would sen- suddenly want to change? Suddenly want to change. It's mankind's choice to be free from God forever. And the best way to explain it, I'm going to use a story about my niece, Willa. She's a two-year-old little brat. <laughs> That's what she is. She has major attitude these days. And yeah, we'll, I'll, we'll reconcile that in the future. But <laughs> there was a moment where I was babysitting her. And I kid you not, as soon as my sister said, OK, everything's good, her food's in the fridge, or you know where her snacks are, all that stuff. And as soon as my sister left, closed the door, kid you not, as soon as that Willa heard that door lock, that Click, we're on the couch, she turns and she's like, snack, <laughs> immediately. And, I, and she grabs my hand, because she does this, because she thinks she's so cute and playing so coy, right? But she grabs my hand and she's like, snack, you know? She's trying to lead me. I'm like, okay, I got played that first time. I'm not gonna deny her, come on. <laughs> I'm not gonna say no, are you kidding me? Uh, but she, she led me over to the cabinet and she knows that they have like those cabinet locks So she can't open it. She needs me at that point. And so I open it up, and I'm looking around for what snacks, and I grab some graham crackers, and she's like, no. And she says, fruit snack. And I say, oh, you want a fruit snack? And I know she's playing me at this point, because she's asking for the specific snack. She waited right when my sister left. She knows what she's doing. But it's the first one around, so I'm like, "Okay, yeah. I'll get you a fruit snack. And I grab her one, I open it up, and we go plop down on the couch. And I think this is a few months back, so we're watching Encanto, I believe. And it's a great movie. I love it. Uh, (laughs) Is that the one we don't talk about, Bruno? No, that's the other one. That is Bruno? Really? No, no, no. Okay, I'm thinking of, uh, I thought this is what it was called. It was the one with the Italian kids. Luca, that's the one it was. There it is. I thought it was called Encanto for whatever reason, but we're watching Luca. That's what it was. And about 10 minutes goes by. She eats her snack, and like clockwork, she says, snack. And I'm like, I know what you're doing. I'm smarter this time around, okay? I know better this time. And so we go, it's like, sure, because the thing is, she can eat cheese like all day. <laughs> For whatever reason, cheese is just her get down. And I know this, and so it's like, okay, I'll give her some cheese. She's not going to get fruit sack. That's not what's going to happen. But that's not what was in her head. In her head, I got there, and I, I opened the fridge this time, and I pulled out the cheese, and she's like, mm-mm. It's like, you, you're not going to have a fruit snack. You get the, mm-mm, she pushed it away. She's like, food snack again. I'm like, you're not going to get a fruit snack. I know your parents would be very upset with me if I sugared you up and you're just like ready to go. And she's like a little moody girl already, so just her emotions. She's two. She's trying to figure everything out, right? But I'm just not going to load her up on sugar. And I said, you're not going to get that. And I like, again, hand her the cheese. And this time she's like bratty. And she like really pushes it away. I'm like, you don't push me. 
you don't do that, all right? Like, you think that might be okay, but that's not okay. That's not how we're going to roll with this. And then she, again, I said, okay, you're not going to have a fruit snack, okay? You're going to get cheese. And at this point, she's whining now, too, just saying fruit snack over and over and whining. And she pushes me away again. And then now I'm like, okay, I grab her to, like, try to get her to focus. And she's, like, squirming everywhere, kicking, uh, throwing a tantrum, just the whole nine yards, okay? And the first thing I thought, like, yeah, this is my sister's kid, definitely. Um, I'm just playing. But uh, <laughs> um, no, but I get her to focus. I get her to just, like, settle down for a second. And I'm telling her, I'm like, look, you're not going to get a fruit snack. Here's what you need to understand. I'm saying this much quicker, probably in baby talk, too. But I'm just going to, so it relates to you better. And I tell her, you can either, you have one of two choices. You can either take this cheese and we could go sit down and watch Luca, and you could have a great time, and I know you love cheese, so don't try to play me like you don't, or you can keep screaming, and you can keep throwing a tantrum, and you will find yourself in timeout. You're gonna lead yourself to timeout, okay? I said, this is what you have, so what would you like to do? And she's just like, food snack! She throws a fit again, so I said, all right, I let you, I'm going to let you have your way. I told you what's going to happen, that you could either take the cheese, watch the movie, or walk yourself to timeout. Those were your two options. And she decided, you know what, I'm going to throw a tantrum, walk myself to timeout. So I took her over, put her in the corner, and I set my phone up for the three-minute timer, because it's three minutes in timeout. It's like the end of the world for her, right? But I put her in that moment. The, po the point being, I share that long, drawn-out story, is because Willa had her way in that moment, right? You could say Willa definitely had her way. I gave her her options. I told her what it was going to be. And then in the end, I just let her have her way. And eternal justice and punishment is God letting people have their way. Eternity away from God is, let, is God letting people deny him. And uh, I said this earlier. God's a gentleman, straight up. He's not going to force himself. He's not going to control us. He's given us free will to choose him or to deny him. And so when people make the assumptions, why would a loving God send people to hell? It's he doesn't. He doesn't. But people choose where they want to go. People choose whether to serve him, to follow him, or to live contrary to him, to walk away from him, to walk even sometimes completely against him. So God doesn't send people to hell, but he just says, you can have your way then, because God is loving. And when we think about it this way, in any relationship, if, uh, if me and Destiny were just still in the dating phase and I was just forcing her to be with me, even though she didn't care about me, she didn't love me, she didn't want to be with me, if I was forcing her, would that be love? No. Clearly, it wouldn't be. And in the same way, when people say that, they need to understand that God loves them so much that he respects their decision, that he respects their, their choice to choose him or to walk away, because God's not going to force us into love with him. He's going to draw people towards him in a kind, in a patient way, in a loving way. But it's up to us whether we want to accept that or not. So God doesn't send people to hell, but people choose it. And God just says, OK, have your way. Have your way. And Romans 124, I think, s speaks this very well. Romans 124 shows that people choose sin despite knowing God's truth, right? Despite knowing this. <sighs> because people go to hell for the pursuit of their own sin, right? And it, Paul says this in Romans 124. He says, therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts. That's important wording. It doesn't say God put this in their heart doesn't say God forced them to be this way. It doesn't say God decided to send them there. It says, therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts. In other words, it's saying God let them have their way. God gave them the lusts of their hearts because people who walk from God want their own hearts to be first and foremost, right? Want their own whatever they believe, whatever they want first. And so God says, have your way. And he says, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts, which leads to it's a good translation to say to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And it says, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. 
They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Leave that up because this language, this language makes perfect sense. It says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. It doesn't say that God exchanged it in their heads or that uh, they just found themselves there. It says they exchanged the truth about God, meaning one, they know the truth about God, but yet they decided to believe a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I think C.S. Lewis probably encapsulates this the best. Can you go ahead and put that up on the screen? C.S. Lewis says this. I think C.S. Lewis is the goat right now. I'm, all, I'm like super about him right now. We'll see how it is in a few months. <laughs> But he says it the best. He says, there are only two kinds of people. Those who say, thy will be done to God, who say, God, have your way. I want to live for you. I want to follow you. I want to go be with you. So he says, those who say, thy will be done to God. Here's the other person. Or those to whom God in the end says, thy will be done. Have your way. Follow that path if that's what you want, because I love you, I'll let you. Hmm. Hmm. When we start thinking about it that way, it's kind of like, it seems probably maybe twisted in your head at times, but as we understand this, it's not twisted to me, it's love. Because God doesn't force people to do, like, he doesn't just pick Jared up and control him like a puppet and make him do work like a robot against his own will. There's two types of people, those who say, thy will be done, God, or God, or to whom God says, thy will be done. Thy will be done. It's amazing. It's beautiful. So this idea that God sends people to hell, it's the assumption that God just picks people, picks them up from earth, and just like casts them in like, ha, 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 ha. It's not like that at all. People decide to walk through that door. People decide that. And that's what we have to understand. So now that we know, now that we got through that first one, now that we understand, oh, okay, God is not just sending people to hell, right? He's not just picking people up. He's letting people choose. Here's the other argument. Isn't punishment overkill? It should be on the screen, but isn't punishment overkill? That's the other argument. It's like, well, that seems way too long. Eternal punishment, that's ridiculous. Because if you think about it, people are living on this earth 60, 70 years, 50 years, 40 years, whatever it is. It's like, why would, so why would it be eternally? That doesn't make sense to me. And as we think about that, it's kind of like, oh, okay. That kind of makes sense. That does sound kind of wrong, right? As we pour through and we'll see, we'll see what's happening. Because let's examine that argument that eternal punishment is too long. Uh, we have to understand something. That in our sense of justice, in what, what we see as justice, how long it takes to commit a crime is not how long somebody should be punished for. <laughs> and so when we think about it, because if we think about it, it could take seconds. It could take two, three, four, five seconds to murder somebody. So should they just be sent to prison for four seconds? for 10 seconds, or should it count on the seriousness of the crime? When we look at justice, it's never how long it took to commit a crime, or it's never how long somebody took to commit an evil, but rather the seriousness of the crime. And the thing that we have to understand and really grip in our hearts today, because I don't think we truly have a grasp on this, myself included, is that we don't take sin seriously. We don't take sin seriously. We all have stuff that we probably do, it's just like, well, this isn't as bad. This isn't as bad as the other stuff. Or I know people, and I'm going to go off on a rant right here. I told myself not to in the notes, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, <laughs> in the Christian realm, in churches, it's usually like, this is what we talk about. Yeah, don't sleep around, don't cheat on people, you know? And then we go, it's like, that's the one that people will talk about, feel comfortable, like kind of sharing, even then, like keep it, but it's like, but then... Everybody's slandering people. Everybody's gossiping. Everybody's like talking bad about people. Everybody's causing strife. Like I'm, I hear this girl saying this about her. I hear this dude saying this about that dude. Uh, and we're not being real and we're not doing any of that. Or we're greedy. It's like uh, all of our money, mine. Like what do you mean, generosity, what? We just look at it as an option, it's optional, right? All of these things like, well, I'm saved. I believe in Christ and I'm not sleeping around, but I'm doing all this other stuff that God considers sin. That God considers sin that is punishable, Paul says, by death. And we'll read through that in a second. 
And as Christians, we have to understand something. And even in understanding the, the seriousness of eternal punishment, sin is serious to God. Sin is very serious to God, no matter what it is. Because he's a holy God. He's a holy God. We minimize it, but we're not in a position to minimize sins, to compartmentalize certain sins, to say one's better than the other just to make ours look better. Just to make ours look better. Well, well, yeah, that was just this weekend I just did whatever it is. So, But I asked God for forgiveness, and it's all good. It's like, what? <laughs> Imagine saying that to your spouse. Imagine saying that to anybody else. Like, yeah, I wronged you, but that was just like, just during the weekend, or that was just that one time, like, it's all good, right? What? And so imagine saying that. That doesn't make any sense. So when we look at God, when we look at him, when we look at sin, we all have sins right now. I can't read your mind, nor can you read mine. But we all have sins in our head that we think it's okay. It's fine. This one will be okay. It's just a few times. It's not all the time. And we reconcile that in our heads, and we reconcile that in our hearts. I've done it plenty of times. But I'm here to say, let's, let's step up. Let's walk in the holiness of the Lord. Let's let him cover us with holiness, because we can't do it. We can't, I can't do it. But God, through me, the Holy Spirit, through us, can move us forward. And so we minimize sin, and we can't do that anymore, because sin is a far worse crime than we think it is. So when we talk about eternal justice, we have to understand that sin is serious. It's not just like, oh, people just uh, kind of did whatever they wanted. Why is that so bad? So we read Romans one twenty eight. We, we read this and understand that sin is a serious crime. Watch. It's continuing on in that passage. And Paul's talking about people who have just denied God, who have just said, right, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We're just continuing in that thought process for this person. And Paul says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, again, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. He said, have your way. He gave them up to a debased mind. He says, they were filled, here's what it leads to, with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetedness. It's like, that or that one's not that bad, right? We think in our head. It's like, oh, to just want somebody else or like to, to want something that's not yours. It's like, that's not that bad. It's like, I take, it's either we take this serious or we don't. <laughs> Plain and simple. And then it says, malice. And it says they're full of envy, like, well, oh, jealousy? Like, wait, that's not that bad. But we walk in jealousy all the time. We walk in jealousy of things all the time. And Paul's like, look, that's what's up with the debased mind when God's like, okay, have your way. Have your way. That's what we walk in, right? It says murder. We all can say murder. Yes, we don't like it. Strife, meaning causing discord, right? Causing strife within your community, causing strife within your family, causing strife within your friends. There's people all the time, right? This happens to me. I've done this where I just play the victim all the time. <laughs> like, I'm the victim, I'm the victim, I'm the victim. They're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. That's causing strife. And it's like, I used to go to a time, it's like, I'm, I have a best friend for like a year, and then like, I'm not cool with them, and then uh, two years later, now this is my best friend, and now, wow, they did something, I don't really like that, right? I'm causing strife left and right. Come on. You know, I used to do this all the time, and I still kind of want to at times. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. And I'm just like, no, that's the old Dylan. Come on, come on, Lord, work through me. And it says deceit. If we're being deceitful, maliciousness, any of that, and it says they are gossips. Ooh, I get sucked into that one pretty easily and have to repent of that. It says slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. It's like, that's, he's speaking that to adults. <laughs> he's not like talking to these five-year-old kids like, respect your parents. He's like, dude, honor your parents. That was something that they understood in the Christians back then, really to like respect your elders, to respect your parents, even though they're probably not the greatest people all the time. This is Paul just saying this. And continuing on, it says, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. This is what sin is, right? This is what it is. And it says this, though they know God's righteous decree, they know it, but they choose not to, right? It says that those who practice such things deserve to die. 
they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And when Paul says they deserve to die, he's talking about a spiritual death. He's speaking of a spiritual death. He's not just like, oh, yeah, like stone them all. He's like, no, they deserve to face eternal justice in a spiritual death of Hades, of Sheol, of hell. Sin against the Creator is serious. Just because it's not serious to us doesn't mean it's not serious to God. And what we got to understand, this is the best way I could explain it, because God is eternal. God is holy. He's righteous. So here's the thing. When I was younger, I could lie to my brother, and if he found out, he'd just like slap me around and <laughs> kind of be done with it, and then we'd play video games that night, be best friends, right? But if I lied to my parents, and they found out, Everything's taken away. I can't see my friends. Uh, they're done with me for about a month. <laughs> That's just how it was, right? My pops is really like, don't lie to me. He's that kind of guy, right? And it's like I, I did the same thing to Nathan. It was, it was over in a second. But then when I did it to my parents, it was much different. More consequences. It was more serious. So what we have to understand is that when we sin, we sin against an eternal and holy, righteous God that's more serious than it is, unfortunately, when I sin to Jake. But even Jesus says, like, dude, when you sin against your brother, you sin against me. So, whoo, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? When we sin against God, it's eternal sin because he's eternal. When we sin against God, it's walking completely contrary, contrary excuse me, to holiness because God's holy. And we have to understand that, and we have to honor that, and we have to know that. It's the same thing, like, I could, we could lie to our coworkers, and maybe they just don't talk to you, but then you lie to your boss, you're probably going to get fired. That sounds just to me, right? Sounds fair. We have to understand it, and we have to see that. So now we talk about that, and we get, like, okay, sin's the serious. It's not based on how long it took to commit the crime or how long it took to sin, but how serious sin is. And sin is against God who's eternal and holy. We get that, right? So now we see that, and we see that people, God doesn't send people to hell. And now we're going to talk about hell. And now we're going to talk about kind of what something is that I don't think we understand is that there's kind of different levels to it. This isn't, we're not going to get like Dante's Inferno or something up in here, but we're going to see that. Watch what Jesus says about this kind of justice and this kind of eternal punishment, okay? In this moment, in Matthew 11, uh, he's talking about John the Baptist, and he says, like, look, John the Baptist, he came, uh, was living an ascetic life, which is basically extreme denial, like not eating foods, certain foods, not drinking certain things, um, just living a certain way. And Jesus is telling them, look, you got him, and you're mad at him. And then, look, you got me. I came not living that ascetic life. And you guys are still mad. Like, what do you guys want? What do you guys want, really? Like, what is it going to be? Because it doesn't seem like you like anything. Okay? And then he goes on to point out the certain cities and the certain people uh, who are kind of living against Christ. And he says, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Go ahead and go to that next verse. And he says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Go ahead, stop right there. Keep that verse. And what we have to understand is Jesus is saying, Chorazin and Bethsaida, I did so much good there. I healed so many people there. I did so many works there. And if it had been done like it was there to these other cities, to Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. And Jesus is saying, I did all of this for you, and still you haven't repented. And still you haven't turned. And when, even when we read that, an understanding is that Chorazin and uh, Bethsaida are Jewish cities. Tyre and Sidon are Gentile cities. And he's saying, all you people hate on the Gentiles, you hate non-Jewish people, guess what? They would have repented. They would have repented. They would have followed me. They would have done that. And he's saying, woe to you, because if it was done here, then they would have repented long ago. Right? And we continue on. And it says, but I tell you, Jesus, this is Jesus talking, but I tell you, it will be more bearable 
on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Hmm. And we start seeing that and we start understanding that because guess what? There's a difference. When people, Jesus always places emphasis and more importance on when, whether or not people know better. Right? There's a difference. He's saying, you guys know better and still you don't turn. These guys don't know any better, but if they don't turn to me, they're going to get judgment too. But it's going to be more bearable for them. You better believe it. And then he continues on. So there's, we're seeing le- different levels of justice. I'm not saying, oh, it's going to be rainbows for people who don't turn to God who don't know any better. It's not. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying, but there's levels to it. And then in verse 23, he says, And you, Capernaum, another Jewish city, he says, Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. And here's what's important. Keep that up. Because Sodom was an evil, wicked city in the Old Testament, in the ancient times, thousands of years before Jesus. And God actually destroyed it. He destroyed it. All of it. And here Jesus is saying, but look, they didn't know any better. But they still face my judgment. But guess what? It's still going to be more bearable for them because you know better. Because you know my word because you've seen my miracles, you've seen Jesus work. So now we're seeing different levels of justice, like, okay, I'm getting this, I'm seeing it. And more emphasis, like I said, is always placed on those who know better. And so when we look at this with, even in the Christian life before we move forward, when we know better and we still choose wrong, more emphasis is placed there. And hear me out on this. I wish it wasn't that way. I don't want it to be that way. I want to do whatever I want. Don't think that I'm speaking this from perfection. I'm speaking this from man. I'm trying to reconcile truth in my brain. Because God's truth is more important than my truth. I'll tell you that. And so God always places emphasis on those who know better. Right? Because they know better. And in the same way, Christians, Paul writes about it in Galatians, I believe. But Christians also, those who faithfully serve, those who faithfully give, who, who honor Christ the Lord as holy, who fellowship with people, who don't neglect um, meeting, gathering together, like Paul writes in Hebrews, who, who uh, expand, who evangelize, who, who serve, who do all of these things, get greater reward, greater reward in heaven, get greater reward when we see eternity. And that's justice, right? Based on what you do. It's not this one size fits all, because God's not about sameness. He's not about like, uh, yeah, you did kind of nothing, but you kind of said some words that made sense, so you could come on in and just get what everybody else is getting. He's not, that, that's not justice. <laughs> it just is not justice at all. So when we see God is saying both, like I said, in both sides of eternity, it's based on what you've done and what you know, okay, as we move forward. And then so lastly, and this is my last thing as we'll move forward, I'll spend a little bit of time here because we're talking about hell. We're talking about level, different levels of justice, and this is the big question. What about those people who have never heard the name of Jesus? What about those people who've never heard the name of Jesus Christ? What about those who've never heard of Yahweh God? Those untapped tribes, right? In like Chile and Brazil, Patagonia, um, I forget where else. But those people who've never heard, untapped, will probably never be reached. Never hear the name of Jesus. What about them? Because that's pretty unfair if God sends them, right? It's pretty unfair. So let's talk about it. Because now we're talking about the varying degrees, right? The difference, it's all... Hell is eternal, and it's misery. But there's different levels to it. Heaven is eternal, and it's great. It's amazing, but there's different levels to it. So now, as we're looking at it, we're going to look at Jesus' words again, because he talks about it the most. And so Jesus, in Luke 12, he's explaining a parable, kind of about the eternity, and kind of talking about what it's going to be like when the Son of Man returns, when Jesus returns. And so he goes on, and he's saying there's a master who's over a household, right? And he has servants. He has workers. And he talks about uh, a servant who does the work and does what they're supposed to do when the master leaves. He's put in charge. And he does all the work so that when the master returns, he's found doing the right thing. And he says, blessed is that guy. Blessed is that guy. Right? But then there's another one that he talks about, and he talks about this servant who gets power from the master, and the master leaves, and what he decides to do with it is get drunk all the time and beat his slaves and beat his workers brutal and viciously. And he says, cursed is that one. Cursed is that one who knows better, right? 
And then here in verse 47, 1247, it continues, and Jesus says, And that servant who knew his master's will. There it is again, knowing what you know matters. And that servant who knew his master's will, this is important, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. When we look at it, it's not like chattel slavery like we talk about in America today. This idea is like indentured servanthood. And so he's like, he works for this person. That's basically what it is. And but when we look at it, though, Jesus in context is talking about a servant who is brutally beating everybody else and getting drunk and lording his power over people. And so he says, the one who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. That's justice. That's justice. And he says, but the one who did not know, the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. This is God talking about his kingdom. And the point being is that people will not be condemned for limited theology, I promise. They will be condemned for violating the light that God put, God put into them. The complete picture of just judgment and justice, right, like I've talked about, is about what people know, especially if they've never heard the name of Christ, whether they know better or not. And so as we go forward with this, Paul is going to kind of like explain this. He's going to kind of theologize this, so to speak. And it's in Romans 2.14. I hope we all understand that parable, but it's in Romans 2.14, and it says this, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, he's talking about God's law, God's moral ethical code, like the light of God. When in written form, right? The Jews have it in written form, have it good to go, ready to go. And he says, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the Bible, the law, the Torah. They are a law to themselves. Go ahead and go to that next one. And it says that they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse them or even excuse them. Stop right there for a second. Or you can move forward, sorry. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Can you go back to that last verse, Ben? Or Jordan, excuse me. And so what we got to see in this, what Jesus was talking about, those who knew better, the, the servant who knew better uh, will receive a severe beating, who will get really extreme justice, right? Paul is saying, look, when those who do not understand God, who've never heard the name of God, who've never seen the law, who don't have the written form of the word, who don't have that, he's saying the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. What he's saying is that people, by nature, we know through scripture that God has put the revelation just enough for us to all understand that there is a creator. He says that through creation, through the invisible attributes of the Spirit. Paul writes that as well. And so he's saying their conscience and their conflicting thoughts when they see something and recognize that something is wrong, that maybe this is evil, maybe I shouldn't be doing that, and their conflicting thoughts either, either accuse them if they know what's wrong and still walk in it, or excuse them if they know what's wrong and turn away and walk the other way from what is evil. So when we think about people who've never heard the name of Jesus, who've never heard Yahweh God, we have to understand that their conscience will bear witness to God or bear witness against God. They'll either recognize evil or recognize, or excuse me, they'll recognize evil and walk away or recognize evil and walk toward it still. And let's go back. This is the last thing I have to say. Let's go back to those uh, unexplored places, right? Or we'll talk about the villages in Africa who get raided, who get ransacked, who they get their, uh, their women stolen, their young girls as little as the age of 10 stolen, sold into slavery, suicide bombers, all that stuff. Let's go back there. Let's say we are a part of that village, okay? Let's say it's all we've ever known. We've never heard the name of Jesus. We don't know Yahweh God. We don't know any of that. It's all we've ever known. Our parents did this. Our grandparents did this. Our great-grandparents did this. And great-great-great-grandparents did this. And we never saw anything wrong with it. We never saw, it's all we've ever known. It's all we've ever understood. This is just what we do. We ransack villages, we burn them down, we kidnap people, and we do evil things. It's just what we do. 
But let's say while we're out and about doing that, when we return to our home, we find that our village has been ransacked. We find that the women have been kidnapped from our village, that our stuff has been taken, that our stuff has been burnt down. And we find this, and we come home to find uh, our home just completely destroyed. There's something that happens in that moment. We either, A, see this and don't think any different, and think, whatever, I'm just going to keep living my life and still doing what I do, or we see it, and now that we recognize how much pain it brings, now that we recognize how much anguish it brings, now that we recognize how evil it is and how, how it makes us feel, we recognize that this is wrong. This isn't right. But I've never understood that before until new information came to play, until new information came to my head, and now I recognize that this isn't okay. This isn't wrong. Right. And in that moment, we have the decision, like I said, either to say this isn't right and turn away or to think no differently and choose evil still. And this is what Paul is talking about, that their conscience will bear witness. It's what they know. People will be judged based on what they know. Those who don't have the law and still follow it or don't have the law and don't follow it at all. And so, like I said, in Romans 2, 14, God looks at the conscience, whether we recognize or whether those people recognize that there is a creator and choose the good or choose the evil. Amen? You guys getting that? So that's what we talked about right there, and I hope I didn't bore you. I hope there's information that's useful. I hope it, this causes you to think, but now we know. It's like, hey, God doesn't send people to hell, right? And the punishment is not overkill. It's necessary. And then what about those who've never heard? What about those who've never heard the name of God? And I think as we carry this forward, I think as we understand this, um, and we just sit on the scriptures and we meditate on them and we commune with each other and fellowship and talk about these things, my hope and prayer is always that this doesn't just go for nothing. I don't speak these messages so it could just be like, oh, look at us, we're so knowledgeable now. I don't care about that. I care that people come to know Christ. Because I believe that people will live with Christ forever or God will let them have their way in eternity separate from him. And the Bible says that there is none righteous, not even one. The Bible says that all love, the Bible says that we love because he first loved us. Love comes from God. Goodness comes from God because it doesn't come from humans. Mercy comes from God because he has the power to give mercy. Everything good comes from God, and to live life separate from him is to live a life that has nothing good. And that carries on into eternity, or we decide and choose, and we get our friends to decide or choose and understand and help them understand that it's Christ or not. Those are the ways. So let's use this information. Let's use these kind of doctrines. Let's use this kind of philosophical thinking to bring the people we know to Christ, to bring the people around us to Christ. Because that's what it's all about. Amen?